today, I'm going to read a transcription of a TED presentation titled The New Generation of Computers is Programming Self. I'll take about uh, half an hour to finish it. And this is my third time to read it. I have read exactly the same presentation twice before. Okay, I'll start. Help us understand what machine learning is, because that seems to be the key driver of so much of the excitement and also of the concern around artificial intelligence. How does machine learning work? So, artificial intelligence and machine learning is about 60 years old and has not had a great day in its past until recently. And the reason is that today we have reached a scale of computing and data sets that was necessary to make machines smart. So here's how it works. If you program a computer today, say your phone, then you have software engineers that write a very, very long kitchen recipe, like if the water is too hot, turn down the temperature. If it's too cold, turn up the temperature. The reasons are not just 10 lines long. They are millions of lines long. And uh, a very and modern cell phone has 12 lines of code. A browser has 5 million lines of code. And each bug in this recipe can cause your computer to crash. That's why a software engineer makes so much money. The new thing now is that the computers can find their own rules. So instead of experts deciphering step by step, a rule for every contingency that you do now is you give the computer examples and have it in for its own rules. A really good example is AlphaGo, which recently was won by Google. Normally, in game playing, you would really write down all the rules. But in AlphaGo's case, the system looked over a million games and was able to enforce its own rules and then be the worst residing Go champion. That's exciting because it it relieves the, the software engineer of the need of being super smart and pushes the burden toward the data. As I said, the inflection point where this has become really possible, very embarrassing. My thesis was about machine learning. It was completely insignificant, don't read it, because it was 20 years ago and back then, the computers were as big as a cockroach brain. Now they are powerful enough to really emulate kind of specialized human thinking. And then the, the computers take advantage of the fact that they can look at uh, very much data than people can. So I'd say AlphaGo looked at more than a million games. No human expert can ever study a million games. Google has looked at over 100 billion web pages. No person can ever study 100 billion web pages. So as a result, the computer can find rules that even people can't find. So instead of looking ahead to, if he does that, I will do that. It's more saying, here's what looks like a winning pattern. Here's that what looks like a winning pattern. Yeah. I mean, think about how you raise children. You don't spend the first 18 years giving children a roof for every contingency and set them free and they have this big problem. They stumble for get up and then get slapped or spanked. And, and they have a positive experience, a good grade in school, and they figure it out on their own. That's happening with computers now which makes computer programming much more easier all of a sudden. Now, we don't have to think anymore. We just give them a lot of data. 
and so this has been key to the specific um, spectacular improvement in power self-driving cars. I think you gave me an example. Can you explain that's happening here? This is a drive of a self-driving car that we happen to have in Udacity and recently made it into a spin-off called Voyage. We have used this thing called deep learning to train a car to drive itself. And this is driving from Mountain View, California, to, to San Francisco on El Camino Rio on a rainy day with bicyclists and pedestrians and 133 traffic lights. And the novel thing here is Many, many moons ago, I started a Google self-driving car team and back in the day, I hired the world's best software engineers to find the world's best routes. This is just trained. We drive this road 20 times. We put all the data into the compute, computer brain and after a few hours of processing, it comes up with behavior that often surprises human uh, uh, ability. So it, it's become really easy to program it. This is 100% autonomous, about 33 miles an hour and a half. So explain it. On the big part of this problem on the left, you are seeing basically what computers say as trucks and cars and those dots, overtaking it and so forth. On the right side, you see the camera image, which is the main input there, here, and it's used to find lanes, other cars, traffic lights, and the vehicle has a radar to do distance estimation. This is very commonly used in this kind of systems. On the left side, you see a laser diagram, where you see obstacles like trees and so on depicted by the laser, but almost all the interesting work is centering on a camera image now. We are really shifting over from precession sensors like radars and lasers into very cheap, commoditized sensors. A camera costs less than $8. And that green dot on the left, left thing, what's that? Is that anything meaningful? This is a look ahead point for your adaptive cruise control. So it helps us understand how to regulate velocity based on how far the car is in front of you are. And so, you also got an example, I think, of how the actual learning part takes place. Maybe we can see that, talk about this. This is an example where we post a challenge to Udacity students to take what we call a self-driving car nano degree. We gave them this data set and said, hey, can you guys figure out how to steal this car? And if you look at images, it's even for humans, quite impossible to get the steering right. Mm. And we ran a computation and said, it's a deep learning computation, AI computation, and we give students 48 hours. So if you have a software houses like Google or Facebook, something like this costs you at least six months of work. So we think out 48 hours is great. And within 48 hours, we got about 100 submissions from students, and the top four got it perfectly right. It drives better than I would drive on this imaginary during deep learning, and again, it's the same methodology. It's this magical thing. When you give enough data to computer now, and to give enough time to comprehend the data, it finds its own rules. And so that has led to the development of powerful applications in all sorts of areas. You were talking to me the other day about cancer. Can I show this video?
Yeah, absolutely, please. It's cool. This is kind of a uh, insight into what's happening in the completely different domain. This is augmenting or competing. It's in the eye of the beholder. With people who are being paid for four hundred thousand dollars a year. Dermatologists, highly trained specialists. It takes more than a decade of training to be a good dermatologist. What you see here is the machine learning version of it. It's called neural network. Neural networks is a technical term for this machine learning algorithms. They've been around since nineteen eighties. The one was invented in 1988 by a Facebook fellow called Jean Lequin, and it propagates data、uh, stages from what you could think of as a human brain. It's not it's not quite the same thing, but it emulates the same thing. It goes stage after stage. In the very first stage, it takes visual input and extracts edges and rows and dots, and the next one becomes more complicated edges and shapes, like little half moons, and eventually is able to build really complicated concepts. Andrew Ng has been able to show that is able to find car faces and dog faces in vast amount of images. What my student team at Stanford has shown is that if you train it in 125,000 images of skin conditions, including melanoma and carcinomas, you can do as good a job as the best human dermatologists. And to convince ourselves that this is the case, we capture independent data set. That we presented to our network, and to 25 board certified Stanford level dermatologists, and compare those. In most cases, they were either on par or above the perform performance classification accuracy of human dermatologists. You are telling me an anecdote. I think about this image right here. What happened here? This was last Thursday. This was a moving piece. What we we've shown before and we published in Nature, Nature, earlier this year was this data that we show dermatologists' images and our computer program images, and can how often they are right. But all these images are past images. They've all been biopsied to make sure we had correct classification. This one wasn't. This one was actually done at Stanford by one of our collaborators. The story goes that our collaborator, who is a world famous dermatologist, one of the three best, apparently, looked at this mole and said. This is not a skin cancer, and then he had a second moment where he said, "Well, let me just check with the app." So he took out his iPhone and ran our piece of software, our pocket dermatologist, so to speak, and the iPhone said cancer. He said melanoma. And then he was confused, and he decided, "Okay, maybe I trust the iPhone a little more than myself." And he sent it out to the lab to get it biopsied, and it came up as aggressive melanoma. So I think that this might be the first time we actually found, in practice, of using deep learning. An actual person whose melanoma would have gone unclassified had it not been for deep learning. I mean, that's incredible. 
feels like there'd be an instant demand for an app like this right now, that you might freak out a lot of people. Are you thinking of doing this, making an app that uh, allows self-checking? So, so my inbox is flooded about cancer apps and heartbreaking stories of people. I mean, some people have had 15, 10 or 20 melanomas removed and the scale that one might be overlooked like this one and also about, I don't know, flying cars and speaker inquiries these days I guess. My take is, we need more testing. I want to be very careful. It's very easy to give a flashy result and impress a tight audience. It's much harder to put something else that's ethical. And if people were to use the app and choose not to consult a distance or doctor because we get it wrong, I would feel really bad about it. So we are currently doing clinical tests. If this clinical test comments and our data holds up, we might be able at some point take this kind of technology, take it out of Stanford Clinic and bring it to Intel World. The places where Stanford doctor never ever set foot. And I do hear this right. And that it seems like uh, what you are saying, because you are working with this army of the city students. And in a way, you are applying a different form of machine learning that might take place in the company, which is that you are combining machine learning with a form of crowd wisdom. And you are saying, uh, and are you saying that something you think that could actually outperform what a company can do, even vast company? I believe this now instances blow my mind, and and I still trying to understand. What Chris is referring to is this com computation that we run. We turn them around in 48 hours, and we've been able to build a self-driving car that can drive from Mountain View to San Francisco on surface streets. It's not planned on par with Google after seven years of Google work, but it's getting there, and it took us only two engineers and three months to do this. And, and the reason is, we have an army of students who participate in computations. We are not the on only ones who use cross-sourcing. Uber and Didi. Uber and Didi use cross-sourcing for driving. Airbnb uses the cross-sourcing for hotels. There's now many examples where people do bug funding, cross sourcing, or, pro or protein funding of all things in cross sourcing. But we've been able to build this car in three months, and I'm actually rethinking how we organize corporations. We have a staff of 9,000 people who are never hired, and I never fail. They show up to work and don't he even know. Then they submit to me maybe 9,000 answers. I'm not obliged to use any of those. I end up pay only the winners. So I'm actually very cheap cheapskate here, which is maybe now the best thing to do, but I consider it part of the education tool, which is nice. But these students have been able to produce amazing deep learning results. So yeah. The synthesis of great people and great machine learning is amazing. I mean, Gary Kasparov said on the first day of 2017 that the winners of chess, surprisingly, turned out to be two amateur chess players with three medial crash. Mediocre to good computer programs that could outperform one grand master with one great chess player, like it was all part of the progress. And it almost seems like you are talking about a much richer version of the same idea. Yeah, I mean, as you followed the fantastic panel yesterday morning, 
two sessions about AI, robotic overlords, and the human response. Many, many great things were said. But one of the concerns is that we sometimes confuse what's actually being done with AI with this kind of overlord fleet where your AI develops consciousness, right? And the, the last thing I want is for my AI to have consciousness. I don't want to come into my kitchen and have a refrigerator fall in love with dishwasher and tell me because I'm not, I wasn't nice enough. My food is not warm. I wouldn't buy this product and I don't want them. But the truth is, for me, AI has always been an augmentation of people. It's been an augmentation of us to make us stronger. I think uh, Kasparov has, was exactly correct. It's been a combination of human smarts and machine smarts that make us stronger. And the theme for machines making us stronger is as old as machines are. Agricultural revolution took place because it makes stream engines and and farming equipment that couldn't farm by itself and never replace us. It made us stronger. And I believe the new wave of AI will make us much, much stronger as a human race. We'll come, come on to that a little bit. But just uh, to continue with the scary part of this for the some people, like what feels like it gets scary for people is when you have a computer that can one rewrite its own code. So it can create multiple copies itself, try a bunch of different code versions, possibly even at random, and then check them out and see if a goal is achieved and improved. So say the goal is to do better on the intelligence test, you know, a computer that's moderately good at that, you could try a million versions of that, you might find one that was better, and then you know, repeat. So the concern is that you get some sort of runaway effect where everything is fine on Thursday evening, and you come back to the lab on Friday morning. Because of the speed of computer and so forth, things has, have gone crazy suddenly. I would say this is a possibility, but it's a very remote possibility. So let me just translate what I heard you say. In the AlphaGo case, we have exactly this thing. The computer would play the game against itself and learn new rules. And what machine learning is the rewriting of the rules. And it's the rewriting of code. But I think there was absolutely no concern that AlphaGo would take over the world. It can't even play chess. No, 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 no. But now, there are all single domain things that's possible to imagine. I mean, we just saw computers that seemed nearly capable of passing a university entrance test, and that can kind of, it can read and understand in the sense that we can, but it can certainly absorb all the tests and maybe the increased patterns of meaning. Isn't there a, a chance that as this broadens out, there could be a different kind of runaway effect? That's where I draw the line, honestly. Uh, and, and the chance exists. I don't want to downplay it, but I think it's remote. And it's not the thing that's on my mind these days. Because I think the big revolution is something else. Everything successful in AI to the present date has been extremely specialized and it's been thriving on a single idea, which is massive amount of data. Reason AlphaGo works so well because a massive number of Go plays. And AlphaGo can drive a car or fly a plane. Google self-driving car or what the city self-driving car thrives on massive amount of data. It can't do anything else. It can't even control the motorcycle. It's a very specific domain-specific function. And the same is true for our cancer ape. There has been almost no progress on this thing called general AI. Will you go to an AI and say, hey, Invent for me special relativity or string theory.
It's totally in the infancy. The reason I want to emphasize this, I see the concerns. Uh, I want to acknowledge them, but if I were to think about one thing, I would ask myself a question. What if we can take anything repetitive and uh, make ourselves 100 times as efficient? It so turns out, 300 years ago, we all worked in agriculture and did farming and did repetitive things. Today, 75% of us work in office and do repetitive things. We are become spreadsheet monkeys and not just low-end labor. We have become dermatologists doing repetitive things. Lawyers doing repetitive things. I think we are at the brink of being able to take an AI, look over our shoulders, and they make us maybe 10 or 15 times as effective these repetitive things. That's what's on my mind. That sounds super exciting. The process of getting there seems a little terrifying to some people. Because once the computer can do this repetitive thing much better than the dermatologist and then the driver, especially, it's the thing that's talked about so much now. Suddenly millions of jobs go, and you know the country's in revolution before we ever get to a more glorious aspect of what's possible. Yeah, and that's the issue. It's a big issue. It was pointed out yesterday morning by several guest speakers. Now, prior to me showing up on stage, I confess that I'm a positive, optimistic person. So let me give you an optimistic pitch. Which is, I think of yourself back 300 year, years ago. Europe just survived 130 years. 40 years of continuous war. None of you can read or write. There were no jobs that you hold today, like investment bankers of engineer or TV ultra. We all be in the fields and farming. Now here comes little Sebastian with little steam engine in his pocket, saying, Hey guys, look at this. We are going to make you 100% as strong as you you can do something else. And then back in the day, there was no real stage, but Chris and I hung out with cows in the stable. And uh, he says, he says, I'm really concerned about it because I milk my cow every day. And what if the machine does this for me? The reason why I mention this is we are always good at acknowledging past progress and the benefit of it. Like our iPhones or our planes or electricity or medical supply, we are allowed to live to 80, which was impossible 300 years ago. But we can now don't, don't apply the same rules to the future. So if I look at my own job as CEO, I would say 90% of my work is repetitive. We don't, I don't enjoy it. I spend about four hours per day on stupid repetitive email, and I'm burning to have something that helps me get rid of it. this. Why? Because I believe all of us are insanely creative. I think the tech community more than anybody else. But even blue-collar workers, I think you can go to your hotel mate and make a drink with him or her. And an hour later, you find a creative idea. What this will empower is to return creativity into action. Like, what if you could build Google in a day? What if you could sit our beer and invent next Snapchat? What, whatever it is, and tomorrow morning is up and running. And uh, that's not science fiction. What's going to happen is we are already in history. We, are, we are unleashed this amazing creativity by deceiving us from farming and later, of course from factory work and have invented so many things. It's going to be even better, in my opinion. And there's going to be great side effects. One of the side effects will be the things like food, food and medical supply and education and shelter and transportation will all become much more affordable to all of us, not just rich people. 
Mm. So when Martin Ford argues, you found that this time is different because intelligence that we've used in the past found new ways to be, be will be merged in the same same place by computer taking over those things. Uh, what I hear you saying is that not completely because human creativity. Do you think that uh, this fundamentally different from the kind of creativity that computer can do? So. That's my firm relief as AI person. I haven't seen any real progress on creativity or out of box thinking. And I see, see right now what, uh, what, and this is really important for people to realize because of what artificial intelligence is so threatening. And so we have, we, we have, we have Steve Spielberg tossing a movie in. We are all of a sudden computers of our world, but it's not really a technology. It is technology that helps us do repetitive things. And the progress that has been entirely on the repetitive end has been a legal document discovery, it's been contrast drafting, it's been screening x-rays of your chest, and these things are so specialized, I don't see a big threat of humanity. In fact, we as people, I mean, as faces, we are becoming superhuman. We are make us superhuman, we can swim across Atlantic in 11 hours, we can take a device out of pocket and shoot all the way to Australia in the real time have that person shooting back at to us. That's physically not possible. We are breaking the rules of physics. Uh, when that's said and done, we are going to remember everything we've never said and seen. You remember every person, which is good for me in my earlier stage of Adermus. Sorry, what, what was I saying? I forgot. We'll probably have a kill of 1,000 or more. There will be no more spelling class for our kids because there's no spelling issues anymore. There's no math issues anymore. And I think that really will happen is that we can be super creative. And we are, we are creative. That's our top secret weapon. So the drops that are getting lost in, the, in a way, even though it's going to be painful, humans are capable of more than those drops. This is a dream. A dream is that human can rise to just a new level of empowerment and discovery. That's the dream. And think about this. If you look at history of humanity, and it might be whatever, 60 to 100,000 years old, give or take almost everything that you cherish in terms of innovation, of technology, of things you built, has been invented in the last 150 years. If you toss in the book or will, it's a little bit colder on the Anzex, but your phone, your sneakers, and this chair is more than manufacturing, penicillins, the thing that we cherish. Now, that to me means the next 150 years we'll find more things. In fact, the pace of innovation has gone up, never gone down. In my opinion, I believe only 1% of interesting things have been invented yet, right? We haven't cured cancer. We don't have flying cars yet, hopefully. Uh, I'll change this. That used to be example people laugh at. It, it's funny, isn't it? Working secretly on flying cars. We don't live twice as long yet. Okay, we don't have this magic implant in our brain that gives us the information we want, and you might be appalled by it, but I promise you, once you have it, you will love it. I hope you will. That's a bit scary, I know. There are so many things we haven't invented yet that I think we'll invent. We have no gravity shells. We can beam ourselves from our location to another. That sounds ridiculous. But about 200 years ago, experts were of our opinion that flight wouldn't exist. Even 120 years ago, if you moved faster than you could run, you'll instantly die. So who says we are correct? Today, that you can be a person from here to Mars. Sub Subashi, thank you so much for your incredibly inspiring vision and your brilliance. Thank you, Subashi and Tufran. And that's fantastic. Well, thank you for watching this. This is my third time for read the presentation titled New Generation Computers Programming Itself. That's all. And uh, thank you for watching. See you later.